Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, March 27th, 2027. So tonight we're going to be talking about. <laughs> so tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, parable of the gem in the rope, which is a parable from the Lotus Sutra. And uh, by way of introduction, it comes from Chapter Eight, which is titled "The Assurance of Buddhahood Given to the 500 Disciples." So just briefly, for those who aren't familiar with the Lotus Sutra. Um, there are sort of two major thematic elements that we're going to touch on. Um, one of them is skillful means, which pretty much the entire sutra is about it, but the first half of the sutra is very explicitly about this idea. And skillful means is described in the sutra as um, throughout the Buddha's career of teaching people, he had to figure out a way that he could try and relate the material to them in a way that was going to be understandable and useful. So, according to the Lotus Sutra, he didn't just jump in with the Lotus Sutra, which was going to be his final teaching before his death. He tried to start with much simpler teachings, starting with something like the Four Noble Truths, which would be easy for people to relate to. And then, basically from there, he introduced more and more complex teachings based on where they were at in their journey, until eventually they were ready to hear his final teaching in the Lotus Sutra. And related to this idea, um, he sort of discusses how the earlier Buddhist paths, the path of the Shravakas, who are people who would come and listen to his, uh, to his teaching and learn that way, as well as the Pratyeka Buddhas, who were sort of solitary meditation practitioners, that both of these roles were actually people who were really on the Bodhisattva path. So the sort of different vehicles that people had used in Buddhism were actually all one vehicle. And skillful means had sort of been misinterpreted as the real truth. So now he has this sutra to explain that these people are all on the same path and that they're all actually bodhisattvas in training. So <clears throat> aside from that, the other major concept that we see a lot in the sutra is this notion of human nature, which is that people have a, an innate seed of awakening. So you already have it, it's there, but you might not know that you have it. And it's that seed of awakening that is what is the reason that everybody is actually on the bodhisattva path because they're on their way to become a buddha which is something that traditionally only a bodhisattva would be able to do so in the sutras so far um, we began with the buddha entering meditation and when he emerges from meditation he's finally ready to tell people this teaching of the lotus sutra and he begins with this teaching of skillful means and after he sort of describes the doctrinal part of the teaching, he predicts that one of his top disciples, Shariputra, who was renowned for his wisdom, was actually himself a bodhisattva and not a shravaka, like he thought he was. So Shariputra is, of course, very surprised, and so is everybody else in the audience. But at that point, it's not too hard to accept that, you know, the Buddha's top disciple, or of course, maybe he's like, maybe he's a bodhisattva, but not the rest of people. Well, then the Buddha goes and gets a hold of the uh, other disciples that he was with at the Deer Park when he taught the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path originally. And he says, well, actually, all of, all of these guys are bodhisattvas, too. And he predicts that they're all going to become Buddhas in future lifetimes, which, of course, they're very happy and very surprised as well. And they relate a parable, sort of giving their understanding to the Buddha about, about this, this new announcement. But then we sort of continue through the first half of the sutra where group after group gets predictions that they're actually bodhisattvas as well and they're going to become Buddhas in the future. Now they should have been able to extrapolate this from the doctrinal teaching in, in the second chapter. But the Buddha wants to make it very clear to people and so he gives them all assurances going through and saying, no, I'm actually saying this about you. No, I'm actually saying this about you. Until we get through everybody. And there's sort of an idea in the Lotus Sutra that these predictions of Buddhahood also apply to us in the present day. They're not just the people who were there on Vulture Peak listening to the monk. <clears throat> so, at this point, um, we talked about Chapter 7, uh, the parable of the conjured city, a couple of months ago. So, this is following right after that, um, that chapter. <clears throat> 
So the Lotus Sutra just assumes that we know who Purna Maitrayani Putra is. Um, he was one of the Buddha's top ten disciples, and if you look in the Pali Canon, there are actually quite a few stories that talk about various accomplishments of his. Um, but the thing that he's the most known for, and all these disciples sort of had their various specializations, Ananda had the best memory, Shariputra was the wisest. Well, Purna was known as the foremost Dharma teacher. So he was better than anyone else at conveying Dharma teachings to any audience that he had. So it's relevant that at the beginning of chapter 8, this is the person who we're addressing. <clears throat> so for a little bit of background on Purna, there are a few different suttas in the Pali Canon that talk about various accomplishments of his. Uh, one of them, for example, was the Ananda Sutta, where Ananda talks about how he would have basically never gotten to where he was at without the initial instruction that Purna gave him when he became uh, a monk originally. And he credits Purna with being the person who uh, made him a stream enter, who caused his first breakthrough into understanding Buddhist teachings. Now, additionally, there's kind of a fun sutra called the uh, Ratavinita Sutta, in which Shariputra wants to meet Purna because the Buddha is always talking about how good Purna is at teaching people. And so Purna shows up to one of the assemblies, and Shariputra doesn't make himself known, but he waits until Purna leaves and follows him, and then says he wants him to, to teach him. And so Purna, not knowing that he's talking to the Buddha's top disciple, uh, tries to convey some teachings to him, and Shariputra is so blown away by it that he reveals his identity and says that basically it was almost like he was hearing the teachings from Shakyamuni Buddha himself. So it's high praise coming from Shariputra. Additionally, I feel like this one's a little bit controversial, but he does appear in the Vimalakirti Sutra as well. And it's kind of an uncharacteristic appearance for Purna. He's teaching a group of, well, he's recounting why he doesn't want to go talk to Vimalakirti when Vimalakirti's ill. And he says that he was teaching a group of monks and Vimalakirti came up and basically told him he wasn't doing a very good job of it, that he didn't really understand the minds of other people. And so Vimalakirti gives him an instruction, or a demonstration, I mean, and out teaches him by essentially using his ability to understand what other people are thinking to be able to relate better to the audience than even the best of the teachers, aside from Shakyamuni Buddha himself. Maybe Purna let him do it, though, so we can make a point. We don't really know. Um, Purna's a little bit cagey as well. There is a sutta that is just called the Puna Sutta, which is uh, the Pali version of, of Purna's name. And in it, he goes to the Buddha and he asks him for instruction on something that he can practice in seclusion. So he wants to go off on his own and practice, but he wants a teaching from the Buddha that he can spend a lot of time on. And so the Buddha walks him through uh, understanding the desires of his various, sense, uh, his various senses and trying to understand how to emotionally distance himself from them. And Purna admits that he's really having trouble with this because he doesn't really understand where those sense perceptions are coming from, uh, where his responses are coming from, when they're starting, when they're ending. And the Buddha says, oh, wow, that's actually really good. That means that you're seeing that there is no self in any one of those particular senses. So he's already sort of on the track for the teaching of, of non-self. <clears throat> And so at that point, the Buddha gives him his blessing to go teach, and he asks, well, where are you going to go? And Purna says he wants to go to Sunaparanta. Suna Suna and Sunaparanta is a place that was well known for having, um, I guess, uh, fairly fierce inhabitants, as it's put in the, in the sutta. And so uh, the Buddha kind of asks him, well, are you sure you want to go there? If you go there, it's pretty likely that people are going to ridicule you. And Purna says, well, if they do, uh, I would go and I would be content with that because, you know, the worst they're doing is ridiculing me. The Buddha says, well, maybe they'll throw stuff at you, though. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, okay, that's fine, but, I mean, at least they're not hitting me with things. So I would be content with that. And, of course, the Buddha escalates this until you get to the point where it's like, well, you know, they might kill you for going there. And he says, well, if that's how it's going to be, then I guess I'll be content with that, too. I'm going to go do it. At which point the Buddha says, yes, well, you're ready to go then. And we have from the, the account in that sutta that when Purna went there, he started a rains retreat and he accrued a thousand lay disciples. And he himself also became an arhat during his time there. 
And this is confirmed at the end of that sutta where the monks come to see the Buddha telling him that Purna died and they want to know where Purna was reborn. <coughs> and the Buddha says basically, well, he wasn't. He was an Arhat. Which confirms his, his achievements, at least in the realms of the sort of understanding from the Pali Canon. So he's a highly regarded figure, but he's especially known for his commitment to the Dharma and also his ability to teach people much better than any of the other teachers who were around at the time, aside from Shakyamuni Buddha. So having that context in mind, <clears throat> Purna is presented in the Lotus Sutra at the beginning of chapter 8 um, as hearing the end of the parable of the conjured city told in the previous chapter where Shakyamuni Buddha talked about how all of his disciples had been with him for lifetime after lifetime up until now. And he had taught the Lotus Sutra to them in all of these lifetimes. And at that moment, Purna had this experience of his mind uh, being purified instantly. And it's described as uh, his mind danced with joy. And he was so excited that he started, you know, he approached the Buddha and he bowed to him and he kind of went off to one side, but he was thinking to himself without really addressing the Buddha, how amazing it was that the Buddha is able to understand this original vow that's deep in the hearts of all of these people who were there in the assembly with him. And this vow, of course, is hinting at this vow to become bodhisattvas that everyone had forgotten from all of these lifetimes past when they heard the Lotus Sutra previously. <clears throat> so Shakyamuni Buddha responds by first talking about the merits of Purna as a Dharma teacher. And he talks about how really, aside from himself, there's nobody else who conveys the Dharma as well. Which of course nobody really disputes because Purna is extremely well respected and everyone knows who he is. He has a huge reputation at this point near the end of the Buddha's life. So this isn't too surprising, but what is surprising is what the Buddha says next, which is that this isn't the first time that Purna's done this. In fact, Purna was the foremost Dharma teacher under every Buddha that he served in the past, which was 90 million Buddhas mm -hmm. in previous lifetimes. Not only that, but he's still the best in the present. And actually, for the immeasurable eons into the future, he's always going to be the best at expounding the Dharma. Well, this might raise some eyebrows. And so the Buddha goes a little bit further and he explains that, well, <laughs> Purna was never actually a Shravaka. He was pretending to be one, essentially. He appeared as a Shravaka because that was much less imposing, and he could move about and exercise humility when he met different audiences. And people really didn't see him as this imposing figure. But the whole time, he was actually a Bodhisattva with transcendent powers, which was why he was so good at being able to understand the minds of other people and to convey things to them in a way that they could understand and accept. Koshi. Well, of course, uh, at this point in the Lotus Sutra, that might not be such a surprising uh, announcement. But then the Buddha gives the prediction of Buddhahood for Purna and says that he'll eventually become a Buddha in the far distant future called Dharma Clarified, who will be in a pure land called Excellent Purity, and that his era will be known as Treasured Clarity. <clears throat> And this extends a little bit further in the verse section immediately after this prediction. The Buddha says that this isn't just something special that Purna was doing. This is something that actually all bodhisattvas do. He says that knowing that living beings delight in lesser teachings and are daunted by greater wisdom, the bodhisattvas therefore take the form of Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas. Employing countless skillful means, they transform every type of living being, saying of themselves, we are Shravakas far removed from the Buddha way. They liberate innumerable beings who will all have success. Even the indolent and those with lesser aspirations will eventually become Buddhas, which is good news for us. Concealing their bodhisattva deeds within while maintaining a Shravaka facade of few desires and a weariness of the cycles of birth and death, in truth, they are purifying Buddha lands. When my disciples show themselves to living beings as having the three poisons or the attributes of distorted views, they are liberating living beings with these skillful means. <clears throat> if I completely explained their various manifestations and transformations, living beings who heard about it would harbor doubt and confusion. I think this is a particularly important section just because 
we finally hear about the three poisons actually being an asset for bodhisattvas, mm -hmm. which is an interesting perspective. And I think it's something that we should think a lot about, the fact that it's much easier to be able to relate to somebody else if you have the same experiences, the same suffering, the same dissatisfaction, etc. Now, that's not to say that bodhisattvas are being dragged around by the three poisons with no sort of control or anything like that. It's that they're willing to be able to engage those three poisons so that they're able to relate to the suffering of other people, which I think is very important because in that case, what looked like a hindrance before is actually an asset. It's what allows you to exercise upaya or skillful means. <clears throat> so at this point, after Purna's prediction of Buddhahood, we get more predictions of Buddhahood for uh, Kaundinya, who was another one of the top disciples of the Buddha. And he's predicted to become a Buddha called Universal Illumination. But then immediately after, Shakyamuni Buddha says, well, actually, all the Shravakas here are going to become Buddhas in future lifetimes. So he makes a prediction for all of them. And what's interesting is they're all going to become the Buddha Universal Illumination at some point in the future. So the way that it's kind of described is, first, Kaundinya will become the Buddha Universal Illumination, and he's going to predict in that lifetime, the next person who's going to become that Buddha. And then when that person becomes the next Buddha universal illumination, then they'll predict the next one, et cetera, et cetera, off into the far distant future. But there's something very important about this prediction as well, which is that at the end of the prediction, Flashing back to the very beginning of the Lotus Sutra, there was a group of Shravakas who left right before the Buddha started teaching because they thought they knew what he was going to teach that day, and they didn't understand that it was a special day. He's finally revealing the Lotus Sutra, so they left. They went to go do something else. And he tells the Shravakas that are there that they need to find the Shravakas who left and let them know what he taught this day and also give them their predictions of Buddhahood. Because just because they left doesn't mean that they don't fall into this same sort of level as everyone else who's there. They too have the seed of awakening and are actually on the bodhisattva path. Now something that's uh, sort of interesting about this is uh, in the commentary Buddhism for Today, which is a commentary on the Lotus Sutra by Nikyo Nuwano, Nuwano talks about the sort of relevance to him of this idea of all of these Buddhas being the same Buddha essentially. They all have the same name. And he says that it's actually a really nice and reassuring thing because it not only puts everybody on this sort of equal footing, that they all can step into the same role, but also the way that this prediction is given, it points to us also in the future being the Buddha universal illumination. Because anybody who's hearing this sutra is getting this prediction, and this is the blanket prediction for everybody who wasn't present. <clears throat> I guess another way of looking at it is that no matter how you sort of look at this idea, it's a nice blanket prediction of Buddhahood for everybody who is on the path and is trying to work toward it, right? Everyone's universal illumination Buddha. So at this point, this parable actually isn't told by Shakyamuni Buddha. It's told by the group of Shravakas who just received the prediction. And for this, it's a very short parable, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull directly from the text for it. <clears throat> so right after these, um, these Shravakas received their, <clears throat> their prediction of Buddhahood, they respond by saying, World Honored One, we always supposed that we had attained final extinguishment. In other words, that they were ready for nirvana, they were arhats, that they'd gone as far as they could go. Now we know how ignorant we were. Why is this? Because we should have gained the wisdom of the Tathagata, but instead contented ourselves with lesser wisdom. And then they go into the parable. World Honored One, suppose that a man went to his close friend's house, became drunk, and lay down there. Meanwhile, the friend, who had to leave on official business, sewed a priceless gem into the lining of the man's robe. Having made this gift, he departed. Lying there drunk, the man was unaware of it. When the man got up, he set out on a journey to another country, 
There he underwent great hardships and expended much effort to secure food and clothing for himself, feeling satisfied with what little he could get. Later on, the man happened to meet his good friend, who exclaimed, What a shame, my good man. For the sake of food and clothing, why would you come to this? I wanted you to have a peaceful and easy life, satisfying the five desires as you wish. It's the desires of the various five senses. So on such and such a day, month, and year, I sewed a priceless gem into the lining of your robe. It must still be there now, because you were unaware that you struggled and strained at labor just to stay alive. How foolish of you. Go now and trade that gem for however much you need, and you will always be able to do what you please, forever free from poverty and want. And then they go to explain the parable, saying that the Buddha is just like the good friend. When he was a bodhisattva, he taught and transformed us, turning our minds toward comprehensive wisdom. We soon forgot about it, however, and were unaware of it. We attained the Arhat way and supposed it was extinguishment, struggling to maintain ourselves and contenting ourselves with what little we could get. However, our aspiration for comprehensive wisdom was still with us and was never lost. Now the world honored one awakens us by saying, Monks, that which you attained is not the ultimate extinguishment. Long ago, I caused you to plant the roots of goodness for Buddhahood, and as a skillful means showed you what nirvana looks like. However, you supposed that you had truly attained extinguishment. World honored one, now we know that we are really bodhisattvas. We've been given our assurance of supreme perfect awakening. For this reason, we greatly rejoice to gain something we never had before. And functionally, this is the end of the chapter. Um, there is a retelling of, the, of this parable in verse form afterwards. But that's pretty much it for what happens in chapter 8. But I think there are a lot of things in this chapter that are sort of interesting, even though it's a relatively short chapter in the sutra. <clears throat> so one of the obvious reflections that we should get from this is understanding that the innate Buddha nature that we have, this sort of seed of awakening, this is something that we should really think of as something like a hidden treasure. We have to look for it. We have to know that there's something to find. But when we do, we can remove the stuff that's covering it and we can actually make use of that treasure, right? It'll change everything about our lives because we understand that our innate nature is fundamentally different than we thought it was when we were <coughs> suffering. But on the other side of that, if we don't know that it's there, of course it can't help our situation in any way. And I think another thing, uh, I mentioned it earlier in the discussion about that verse section where he was talking about his disciples who manifest the three poisons and look like they have distorted views, etc., as well as appearing like, like Shravakas. And I think it's, um, we sort of have a tendency to, when we look at our flaws, we think that this is something that we need to immediately fix. It's something that's wrong and needs to be gotten rid of. Well, that's one way of seeing them. And that very much fits in line with what all of the Shravaka disciples were trying to do for their careers as practitioners, to reach the stage of becoming arhats by fixing all of those things, by removing the three poisons from themselves, by removing their distorted views. Now here we have kind of a broader perspective on how we can actually use those flaws as a way to be able to connect to other people, to understand, to experience compassion for other people, and to actually be more helpful to them because we can understand what they're going through, because what they're going through relates to what we're going through. These are universal issues that living beings face. And I think that's a very important thing to think about, because um, we often look at people and make sort of snap judgments about, you know, this person's a good person because they do X, Y, and Z. This person's a bad person because they did X, Y, and Z, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's something that we do sort of by default. It's very easy to do. But we should also, thinking about this story, try to keep an open mind about the people that we encounter. The reality is that all of us do things that are harmful and all of us do things that are beneficial. And one doesn't really cancel out the other. They're all things that we do. So it's important when we're dealing with other people and we see them at a bad moment 
not to dismiss that as who this person really is. Especially as Buddhists, we should understand that this is one moment of this person's life, right? They could be a very different person a moment from now. That doesn't mean that the things that people do aren't there, but I think we close ourselves off from opportunities to learn a lot from other people just by not being willing to talk to um, sort of members of society who are seen as pariahs and these kinds of things. And then really, I feel like I personally have learned a lot and it's helped me a lot to be able to talk to people that maybe otherwise would be ignored or that people might not want to talk to because of how they present themselves. One of the more important concepts from this chapter, and it's not discussed in these terms explicitly in the chapter, but in that same commentary I was talking about, the uh, Buddhism for today, uh, Nuwana talks about this idea that he calls leading by a half step. And he sees this as being something that we should learn about how Perna was able to teach so many people, why he was considered such a great teacher. So for the Buddha, he's able to understand the minds of all of these sentient beings, and he's the person who has attained supreme perfect awakening. There's not really a way that he can be a less imposing figure, I think, for people. But somebody like us, you know, we as everyday people going about living our lives, we have the ability to actually do something similar to what Perna was doing, to be able to approach people with this attitude of humility and to not really step into the position of trying to assert ourselves as authorities over other people's lives, um, trying to give them a lot of advice about what they should do. Instead, this principle of leading by a half step is talking about walking side by side with people as a form of leadership, as a form of instruction. And this is to say that you're putting yourself where they're at. Leading by a half step is that when the going gets rough, you're willing to put the, the first foot forward and bring those people along with you. This is maybe not the way that we often think of what makes somebody a good leader or a good teacher. We tend to sort of lionize the ideas of, you know, these kind of great people who tower over society and we look to them because they're really the paragons of what we want to be at some point. And so I find it interesting that Purna, who is the most successful of the Dharma teachers aside from the Buddha himself, doesn't really use that method that he's much more into making himself not seem imposing, trying to figure out what issues people have going on, and then trying to essentially walk with them, to bring them along with him. And that, I think, is something that I definitely would like to learn how to do better and try to pay attention to with respect to this chapter in the, in the Lotus Sutra. That's one of the reasons that it's one of my favorite chapters. I think there are a lot of interesting lessons and principles that are hidden in it within that main story of the parable and the predictions of Buddhahood. Well, with that... <laughs> do we have any questions, comments, or thoughts? And first, um, I didn't see if Ichishima Sensei... He's not there. I'm He's not here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Sensei, if you have uh, anything that you would like to add before we open it up. Yeah, I was just going to mention uh, very briefly that your discussion on Purna, uh, I think that it's important because we, and tying it to what you were saying at the very end, mm -hmm. we we think about Shakyamuni Buddha's discourses, and the sutra are coming from the discourses. But we know from uh, scholarship now that many of the discourses which are attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha were actually many of his disciples. Mm -hmm. We know... Um, Many of his disciples, they were real people, and we know who they were, we knew their parents, their, um, their lives, um, pretty well documented. And when we think about Buddhism, we, and we think about Buddhism as the plurality of the various forms of Buddhism that's there, much of the, um, the differences that exist within Buddhism is partly because different people were also teaching these materials, but they were attributed to the Buddha. And that these teachers, not only were they attributed to the Buddha to legitimize them, 
Because maybe you would have said, oh, Purna, I don't want to read him. I want to read what Chakmah Buddha had to say, right? Um, and so we have to remember that Buddhism is not about a single person. I think that that's one of the things that really makes it um, not unique necessarily, but certainly singular in the sense that many others we look at a founding, a founder, Abraham or Jesus or Muhammad, and we tend to focus in on, on that particular person, or in the case of, of Jains, the Mahavira, Mahavira. But in the case of Buddhism, Buddhist wisdom was not resident in only one person. And I think it's important for us to remember that, that it was accumulation of wisdoms from many different people, much of whom we attribute to Shakyamuni Buddha, but he was just one of many. And then after that, after Shakyamuni Buddha's death, you still had people like Nagarjuna, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they all contributed really important things to the teaching we know today. And I think that that was a, your exposition on, on Purna was a really good example of that. Would you say that the, that the chapter almost um, represents that kind of uh, continuing teaching in terms of uh, it, it, we're, uh, we're assuming that the Lotus Sutra was written much later a after Shakyamuni Buddha, right. but it's always attributed to him. Right. Um, would this play into this theme of this of, of this chapter whole, of kind I of... I think the whole sutra plays into that theme. The entire sutra plays into that theme. Not only was the accumulation right. of all the teachings, but in a sense it was the accumulation of all the teachers. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, I guess we'll stop the recording, and then if anybody has any questions or comments,